can't go that way for some reason. <laughs> hey you, do you have any idea what the story of that game is? Would you like to hear a totally true and objective recounting of the franchise's timeline? Splendid. Now, let's begin. It all started in the year 1983 in the small town of Hurricane, Utah. Local robotics and fursuit enthusiasts Henry Emily and William Afton had realized a stunning lack of yellow bears in the heavily Mormon-dominated state and knew they were destined to fill this void. Getting straight to work, they created Ferdinand von Bernard, a golden grizzly with the voice of honey butter. However, the audio discs they used to mimic precisely what a real bear looked like were too convincing for the masses, and the entire town evacuated after thinking Ferdinand was out to eat them all. Contrary to what you may be thinking, this assumption wasn't unfounded. Ferdinand did in fact dine on a local restaurant owner that morning due to faulty coding on William's part. Henry and William decided that Ferdinand was unappreciated in his time, and decided to make a cartoony redesign named Fredbear. It was at this moment that the partners realized Fredbear needed a location to actually reside in for people to come visit, and so they bought out a local pizzeria that was recently closed for totally unknown reasons. At this point, the restaurant was ready to open. The pizzeria was a hit, especially with kids. Henry and William had not anticipated the success, and poor Fredbear was overwhelmed by the attention. He tragically, spontaneously combusted on stage on February 31st, 1983. Henry and William, now robbed of their star performer, had to come up with an emergency plan to replace him. Their solution was to create two new animatronics, being Fredbear 2.0 and Spring Bonnie, and have the suits built with the capability to climb inside and wear them by cranking back the endoskeleton interior with a new contraption they dubbed Spring Locks. This was done so that if the animatronics got too nervous, an employee would be able to take over and perform on stage for a brief amount of time. Ignoring the spring lock failures that killed Harold the janitor and Trevor the cashier, this solution worked wonders for the company. With a much higher tolerance for large crowds, the two characters won over the hearts of many, and William secured a deal to make a TV show called Fredbear and Friends, with a low-budget video entertainment company. As for Harold and Trevor, though, they just kind of showed up every now and then as shadow creatures that vaguely resembled the suits they died in. As this unfolded, however, William's two sons, Michael and Cassidy, had a feud going over a game of Uno. Michael had suffered a humiliating defeat in the card game one night after Cassidy made him draw four eight turns in a row. Michael's solution to this crushing defeat was simple. For the entire week leading up to Cassidy's birthday, Michael would jump scare him using a mask of one of William's new characters, Foxy. This was very cathartic for Michael, but things got out of hand when Michael and his Uno buddies tossed Cassidy into the jaws of Fredbear 2.0, who suddenly got a nervous breakdown and clamped his teeth down on the boy's skull. Shockingly, this incident didn't kill Cassidy. He was quickly rushed to the hospital and was diagnosed with a mild concussion, much to Michael's relief. However, Cassidy then revealed that he never existed, and then disappeared directly before Michael's eyes, becoming one with him. All that remained on the hospital bed was a strange glowing orb of a substance later given the name Remnant. After Michael told his father what had happened, William looked at him in confusion as he didn't recall ever having a second son. At this point, Michael started questioning his sanity. However, the bite of 83 was still very real in the minds of the public, and so Henry and William watched as their restaurant was shut down. This wasn't the end, though, as William then revealed that they would be able to open a new restaurant using the characters introduced by the Fredbear and Friends TV show. And thus, the rise of Freddy Fazbear's Pizza began. Fast forward to 1985. William was hungry on a cold, rainy Tuesday night, and so he stopped by at a local McDonald's that for some reason had a sign labeled Junior's. I would like a double cheeseburger and a large Coca-Cola. That'll be five dollars, sir. This was the moment William Afton snapped. Where's my five dollars? He remembered. Henry owed him five dollars from Sunday night. William, now a broken man, angrily drove to Freddy Fazbear's Pizza to confront his business partner. However, standing at the door was Henry's daughter Charlie, who William realized would make the perfect example to put Henry in his place. It is at this time that I should mention William Afton is a psychotic serial killer who murders people in his spare time. 
With Charlie out of the picture, William tossed her body right into the alley next to the restaurant as he didn't actually know what to do to dispose of it. A security puppet meant to protect Charlie managed to sneak out of the restaurant though, and before being soaked and destroyed in the rain, it clung to Charlie's body and their collective souls fused together. William felt awfully proud of himself and decided that instead of leaving good enough alone, he should turn right back around and strangle a couple more children just to spite Henry some more. He dressed up in his old spring bonnie suit and lured them all to the back room by telling them their dead dogs were alive in there with old man Jenkins. None of these children actually had dogs to begin with, but they were extremely gullible. You may think this ended violently, but for some reason William had a strange way of just killing people by casually walking up to them and staring them down. Thank goodness. After pulling this off, William disposed of the bodies by just tossing them inside some empty suits and waltzing out without anyone noticing for a solid week and a half. After people started smelling something, the restaurant closed and William's revenge was complete. Two years later, Henry opened up a new location with stunning new plastic abominations with state-of-the-art criminal detection scanners and a knack for defying gender norms of the era. However, within exactly six days of the place being opened, the old animatronics got possessed thanks to Charlie, now known as the Puppet, giving the missing children new life as decrepit animatronic monstrosities, and William purged an extra five kids from existence. They never came back up in the narrative after this point, but popular speculation believes all five of their spirits congregated in Balloon Boy because they thought it was funny. Also, the mangle chopped off Jeremy Fitzgerald's frontal lobe in the bite of 87, but he was fine and it grew back in a month. Regardless, the bad press from these rapidly occurring incidents forced Henry to shut it down, flushing the thousands of dollars he spent on the new animatronics right down the drain. William, now content with these circumstances, decided it was high time to start his own company alone without the risk of losing another $5 to a business partner. So, he founded Afton Robotics, and created a brand new quartet of characters for his sister location of Freddy's called Circus Baby's Pizza World. However, these animatronics had a quirk to their designs. Each one was designed to lure and capture children to extract their remnant so that William could study the strange substance and gain immortality or whatever. Also, their faces are chrome and can open up for no reason. The problem with making murder robots is that they murder people. William learned this the hard way when he found out six-year-old girls tend not to take you seriously when you tell them not to walk up to the pretty clown robot with an ice cream dispenser. His six-year-old daughter Elizabeth walked up to the pretty clown robot, obviously, and instead of giving her ice cream, Circus Baby straight up just launched a claw at her and stuffed her inside her endoskeleton. Now that William's designs were proven to work properly, he chickened out and closed the restaurant before it even opened, and blamed it on gas leaks because apparently, accidentally killing your own child is traumatic or something. Smooth move, Mr. I murdered 11 children for literally no reason. On Henry's side of things, he just grabbed the creepy, smelly old animatronics that were missing their faces and hands, and just went, yeah, I can fix this, and then did exactly that. Sometime between 1987 and 1993, he opened the final Freddy's location of the 20th century, and reception to the pizzeria amounted to resounding, ew. As it turns out, people usually aren't attracted to restaurants with histories of employees dying in spring lock suits and children suddenly being turned into animatronics by creepy marionettes. Come 1993, the place probably gets like two customers a week, and there are cobwebs everywhere, and they got desperate for a security guard after the head guy died to all four animatronics in the restaurant. Good thing he left some voice messages to help out the new guy. Speaking of the new guy, remember Michael Afton? He applied. He also called himself Mike Schmidt when he joined the Fazbear family, likely due to his father's tendency to murder entire rooms of people every other Tuesday. Michael had a very useful skill that he inherited from Cassidy after the boy vanished from space-time and fused his mind with Michael's, sitting still and hiding like a coward. So naturally, Michael did a fantastic job for his Five Nights at Freddy's, and then even worked some overtime hours for the sixth and seventh nights. What a champ. Unfortunately, Michael didn't get the memo that tampering with animatronics isn't recommended for a healthy work environment. Previous employee Fritz Smith learned this the hard way. Since Michael cranked the character's AI to the maximum setting just for the challenge, Henry decided to fire him for his own well-being and just blamed it on him for getting to apply deodorant before coming to work that night. The restaurant closed like a week later because literally nobody was coming to eat there. That's what you get for just making the animatronics inexplicably creepy looking, Henry. 
Back to Michael, though. His desire to tamper with animatronics and play chicken with death was only growing stronger. Lucky for him, William had converted Circus Baby's Pizza World into an underground bunker that you could rent the animatronics from after Freddy's closed down. Before Michael went down there for his first night, William dropped him with the demand that Michael find Elizabeth's soul and free her. Father, how do you expect me to do that? Oops, I couldn't hear you. I'm going to vandalize Henry's house again. I will come back. He didn't come back. Michael then befriended the only animatronic to ever actually speak her mind about anything. Baby. I don't know how dumb you have to be to trust a word a probably haunted robot designed to murder children says, but Michael was the guy who threw his brother into an animatronic bear's mouth just for kicks and giggles, so I can't say I'm surprised. The other animatronics in the facility weren't as welcoming though, and they would just try and murder Michael on the spot despite Baby coming up with a way better plan as the week progressed. One night she decided enough was enough with being fake, and she just kidnapped Michael and stuffed him in a spring lock suit without a second thought. Other than having to wind the springs to avoid being impaled while tiny ballerina goblins crawled inside the suit all over him, Michael managed to get out just fine, minus the fact he was just missing his pancreas with no context given. He went home to watch another episode of a subpar soap opera made by the same company that produced Fred Bear and Friends, and the next day got tricked by Baby into waltzing straight into the room he just saw the night before with a machine that scoops out animatronic endoskeletons. Michael decided the best course of action while facing this deadly machine was to just stand directly in front of it, and the animatronics, now merged together into an entity called Ennard, scooped out his organs and skeleton and climbed into his skin to escape the facility and live out life as a normal human person. After a couple days, the dead skin suit rotted and turned purple, and Ennard realized that people noticed that kind of thing. Ennard threw himself up out of Michael's body and told him, Oh, you won't die, huh? And Michael just magically possessed himself and walked away like nothing happened. He still had no bones. When he got home, he realized that William didn't ever come back, but he still talked about what happened as if William could possibly hear him and vowed that he would find him. Then Mike did absolutely nothing for 30 years other than have nightmares about the animatronics from the 1993 Freddy's restaurant in order to gaze upon the elusive true form of Ferdinand von Bernard, known most commonly as Nightmare Fredbear. What was William up to anyway? Well, when he went to vandalize Henry's house, he ran into a barbed wire fence, which proved to be slightly painful to trespass. So, he turned his attention to the now closed Freddy's location and started tearing the animatronics to shreds with his bare hands. Why nobody tried this when the characters were an actual threat is beyond me. As it turns out, the ghosts of the kids William murdered were in those suits, and so they all ganged up on William and just kinda stared at him. One of them followed him around a little bit, so he ran into the safe room hidden in the restaurant and dressed up in his rusty old Spring Vani suit for... some reason. I don't know if he thought that would help trick them or if it was just a comfort character or something. Regardless, the leaky ceiling and William's dramatic evil laughter caused the flimsy spring locks to snap back into the endoskeleton form, and William was impaled in literally every single place you could think of. And in death, William Afton became Springtrap. Thirty years later, some surfer dude decided it would be funny to open a horror attraction based on the Freddy's locations due to their discomforting animatronics and history of child murder incidents. Before he could open the location, though, he wanted to find a real animatronic to toss into the attraction and sit there, I guess. Lo and behold, he managed to find the one animatronic that had a dead serial killer inside it, and despite the probably awful smell, he just threw it in there without a care in the world. Also, Springtrap continued his age-old method of murder by just casually walking up to the security guard and staring at them. Five nights later, and the faulty wiring in the attraction shorted out, and the entire building burned to the ground. Springtrap turned out okay though, granted he lost his pants and he wasn't gonna just live with that. So, after escaping the charred remains of the building, he managed to find the old Fredbear's location and dig up another Spring Bonnie suit to get inside after painfully prying his tangled up guts out of the old one. Also, he decided to stop going by Springtrap and start going by Afton again. Don't worry about it. Anyway, remember Ennard? Yeah, so after floating around in the sewer all this time, three out of four of the animatronics in there got sick of Baby making all the creative decisions, and so they just kinda tossed her out. Then they put the most obnoxious member of the group, Funtime Freddy, in charge, and he themed their entire persona around him. What a loser. Baby, meanwhile, took some traffic lights and plastic and a giant claw and fashioned herself a new body to go out and walk around or whatever. Don't worry about this, it's never addressed again. 
Henry was still alive, by the way, and he decided that it was high time to finally do something about all the undead animatronic menaces running around in Hurricane Utah. He opened a brand new Freddy's Pizzeria and hired a random person to be the manager, in the hopes they're gutsy enough to salvage three death robots and fend them off while buying party hats in a cramped metal office. This random person just so happens to be Michael Afton, who despite literally dying brutally to Ennard, decided that it would be a great idea to do this a third time and see what would happen. Coincidentally, Michael's very unmotivated goal of finding his father worked out perfectly because Afton just kinda showed up on his own. Scrap Baby and Ennard, now called Molten Freddy, also showed up and Michael dragged them into the vent system for sweet, sweet cash. Now, Henry had one last trick up his sleeve. He had figured out Charlie possessed the puppet and was still out there somewhere, so he designed an animatronic that could lure, capture, and contain her. He called this animatronic Lefty, and then did everything in his power to get Lefty into the restaurant by either selling him on the shopping catalog for five bucks, or making Michael salvage him to earn way more money. Once every animatronic was tossed into the ventilation system, Scrap Baby finally piped up and gave a little monologue about how she was super excited to do what she was created to do, and murder children to make her dad proud. Afton said nothing regarding this matter, so I don't think he actually cared. Henry cut her off though, and revealed that the entire pizzeria was a trap designed to finally destroy the last remnants of its legacy, and end everything once and for all. He also told Afton that the darkest pit of hell was waiting for him, which was kind of a given thanks to the whole serial killer thing. William Afton, now burned alive in a second fire, suddenly wakes up in front of a character selection screen for what seemed to be a challenge to fend off almost every animatronic he and Henry had created. He was even on there twice as Springtrap and Afton. What a deal. William immediately cranked all 50 characters shown on the screen to their highest difficulty, and was greeted with the most obnoxious night of his entire existence. After like a week of dying over and over with characters talking about how this was the making of the one you should not have killed. William managed to actually reach the end of the night, and discovered that the one he should not have killed was a child named Cassidy. Not to be confused with Cassidy Afton, who was fused with Michael Afton. This Cassidy appeared every now and then as a ghostly form of Fredbear called Golden Freddy, and just purged people from existence because he could. Having this randomly unique ability made him feel real high and mighty compared to the other children that William definitely also should not have killed. But whatever, we won't worry about it. After Cassidy had his fun torturing William, he phased out of existence, and William managed to crawl back into our realm and possessed a virtual reality game that Fazbear Entertainment made in order to cover up all of his crimes. How the company survived after Henry shut it down, I have no idea. Regardless, William decided to manifest himself as a virtual version of his original Spring Bonnie suit, and thus, Glitch Trap was born. However, Glitch Trap is a boring name, so I elect to call him Malhair, and will do so for the rest of this video. Malhair managed to drive every single beta tester of the VR game insane, and after setting everything in motion, he watched as the final beta tester did every step necessary to complete his plan to invade her mind and be able to come back to the real world. This beta tester's name is Vanny, by the way. Once Malhair infiltrated Vanny's mind, he began to give her commands and she would follow them accordingly. Anyway, Vanny started tampering with Fazbear Entertainment's special delivery service, and introduced a replica of Springtrap into their rental system for no reason. William doesn't even possess him, he's just there. Still, Springtrap is rad, so I don't care. So, to catch you up. Everyone but William is dead, Vanny is just now coming onto the scene, and Fazbear Entertainment has gone crazy with covering up their crimes, renting out glitchy at best, murderous at worst animatronics to people, and now they're on their way to open a gigantic pizzaplex with four brand new Glamrock animatronics that can house entire children inside their stomachs. And Vanny is dressing up in a rabbit costume to murder them. Gotta love family traditions! Oh yeah, Vanny is probably an Afton. Now, do you got all that? What happened to Ferdinand von Bernard? Ha <laughs> ha, you silly goose. Ferdinand never left. Ferdinand sees all. Ferdinand knows all. Ferdinand is here. Ferdinand has revealed the truth. 